come to the uh, 18th chapter here. We're in the 6th section of the book of Revelation. Each section keeps adding to the story, pointing us to the end of the age and what it means when Christ returns and God sets up the kingdom that he intends for his son to rule and reign over eternally. When there's a new heavens and a new earth, all of that from chapter 1 has been pointing us to that. And each section has been reminding us of just what it looks like as we think about that end of the age and as we come to it. Now, so we're going to be in chapter 18. It's a part of chapters 17 through 19. And it is important for you to understand this morning what this section, the sixth section, is about. It's a section that has to do with the fall of Babylon. Every time you read in chapter 17, 18, and 19, that phrase, Babylon is fallen, Babylon the Great is fallen, over and over again, you're going to see that in chapters 17 through 19. So here's how I've broken up the chapter. First of all, last week we looked at chapter 17, and that has to do with the description of Babylon. It lets us know what Babylon is like. And if you remember as we looked at that, we said Babylon is in contrast to another city in the Bible, and that is the city of Jerusalem. And so Babylon is the city of man, as it were. It's the purposes of man, the life of man. It's everything in this world that the world lives for. And it's summarized under that statement called the city of Babylon. It is a literal city. It has been a literal city. It's modern. It's where modern day Iraq is today. So it is a literal place, but it speaks more to us than just about a literal physical piece of ground. It speaks to us about the the mind of man, the way of the lost, the way of the world, and how they tend to think totally in the opposite direction of God. In fact, Babylon wants to get rid of God. It wants to be done with God. It wants him for nothing. But in contrast, in the Bible is another city. It's the city of God, and that is the city of Jerusalem. That is where God's major work of redemption took place to restore and rescue and redeem the world. And we'll see that city come down when we get over to the new Jerusalem. We'll see it. We'll look and see what that looks like, this city of God. But now we're in this section, chapter 17 through 19, where it is describing for us what Babylon is like. And remember, Babylon in chapter 17 and 18, as well as 19, is continually presented as a woman. Presented as a woman, and not just a woman, but a woman who is a prostitute, who is a harlot. And the reason she is presented that way, that mindset of the world, is because the world's goal and the objective, obviously, with Satan and his cohorts behind it invisibly, uh, pulling the strings in one sense to this world and, and playing upon the fallenness and the deceptive hearts and sinful fallenness of man, that goal of that harlot is to draw men and women, boys and girls, everyone they can away from the true love that they should love, and that is God. And so there is this call and this reminder for, for, for us to think that this Babylon city here is a city that really is seeking to keep men and women from loving God and following Him. Uh, just in the back, back there, can you all find out if there's a buzz on somewhere? That's just kind of, yeah, it must be this something. That's it right there. There you go. And we don't want to have those, that distraction. Thank you very much. So whenever we think about what Babylon is like, if you were to ask Babylon, what is the chief end of man? They would go, man, live it up. Live for yourself. Please yourself. Do whatever you want to do because this is it. You know, the commercials are all grab all the gusto you can and the passion of this is your life. Live it now. It's all about this world. But that statement, which comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechism, when it asks that question, it gives a complete different answer. It says man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's what God created us for, to first glorify Him. And that's why, like in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, it'll say this to us, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to what? The glory of God. Listen, you you can't think of one part of your life that God doesn't demand that we live for His glory, that we put the attention upon Him, that He gets the spotlight and He gets the focus and life is all about Him. So that is our goal. That's what God created us for. It's man's chief end to glorify God and then enjoy Him forever. You see, those in Babylon wouldn't answer that way. Those in the world system wouldn't think that way. They would think about their lives glorifying themselves, living for what they want, and they're going not to enjoy God forever. They're going to be banished from God forever 
But that's the way they think. But this is the goal. This is the aim of what God had created us for. And you know what? Listen, brothers and sisters, that's the goal for every man, every woman, every boy and girl. Every lost person this day, it is right to say, you know what? God's chief end for you is to glorify him. The problem is they don't know that. Or if they know that, they resist that. They won't believe that. They will not surrender to that. They will not yield to that. We as Christians know that. We know that we, as the redeemed, as those who have been saved and justified and forgiven, we know that we are to live for the glory of God. And that's the fabric of who we are. That's something you find in the heart of a person who's really a Christian. They strive for that. They long for that. They pursue that. And they grieve, don't we, whenever we don't glorify God as we should. That just grieves us. So this city of Babylon that's being described here in this section here is a total contrast between what God's people are like and what this world and the people in this world are like. So that's the description. Uh, Moving on. Then secondly, as we come this morning in chapter 18, we're going to look at the destruction of Babylon. Because as I said, if man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, those who have not come to Christ, who are not glorifying God, they will not enjoy Him forever. In fact, this 18th chapter is going to describe their destruction. And then finally, when we come to the end of this sixth section, you're going to find that Babylon having been destroyed, there is a delight and a celebration of God's people. It's not celebrating and delighting over the judgment on sinners, but it is celebrating and there is a rejoicing, and we'll see this next Sunday as we study chapter 19, that God is a just God, that He's a righteous God, that He accomplished what He said He would do to bring about His kingdom and establish His his city in this world. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at chapter 18. And as we come to chapter 18 this morning, and we think about Babylon and the fall of Babylon, there's just something I want to make sure you understand, and you you understand why we can come to this chapter and rather quickly go through it. In one sense, chapter 18 is not going to tell us anything different than what we've learned in chapter 17. You say, well, why did John waste that ink then? That doesn't make sense. Why did God inspire him to write chapter 18 if chapter 17 is saying something already that we're going to see in chapter 18? What I mean by that is that in chapter 17, we've already seen over and over again that Babylon that is described is going to be judged. So we know Babylon is going to be judged, and we know that this judgment is coming someday. When you get to chapter 18 and you look at Babylon, this city of man, this mindset of the world, what chapter 18 does is it it describes in some details what that judgment looks like. It's going to describe in details what the judgment looks like upon the city of man, the, 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 the world in which sinners love and live in. So it's prophetic in one sense because chapter 18 is yet to come in the sense that when Jesus returns, that day of destruction and judgment will fall on that city. And when you read chapter 18, and I hope you have before this morning, when you read this chapter, what you see is it's somewhat like an Edgar Allan Poe scene here. I mean, it's kind of like that. There's a desolate city that is left. It's haunted by demons and vultures perched everywhere. And it is a city that was once great, but now it has become a nightmare because its day is over. Judgment has fallen. So though it is a literal city in the Old Testament, and obviously we come to this chapter, we're thinking figuratively of the mindset of the world, the people in that world, and how they live. You say, how do you know that this is not a real city that, well... It's not hard to figure out. Anywhere in the book of Revelation, when John speaks of a city, it becomes very clear as to whether or not he's talking about a literal physical city or something that's a city that's figurative of something else like Babylon. For example, when he talks about Babylon in the book of Revelation, we already saw in chapter 11 that he described Babylon as the great city which mystically, you see that word mystically, is called Sodom and Egypt. So he's saying Babylon kind of represents something more than just a literal city here. In chapter 17, uh, John calls uh, Babylon mystery Babylon. And so again, when he wants to make us think in terms of, I'm thinking more than a literal city here. I'm thinking of something that is figurative. It's really teaching you something that you need to know about the people who have come out of that type of city and in that world. He uses the language like mystically and, and mystery kind of things. When he talks about, for example, in contrast, think of this, back 
in the very first three chapters of the book of Revelation when we studied about the seven churches there, you know, the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, Pergamon, on and on, he never says mystically Pernum. He never says the mystery Ephesus. Those are real, literal cities that he's referring to there. So I want you to approach this chapter with me this morning thinking about this city of Babylon, this mindset of the world, the system of the world, the way the world apart from God and from Christ thinks. And I want you to walk through it rather quickly with me because we're not going to need to explain a lot of details in this chapter because it has already been described in chapter 17 and now we see the destruction of it happening in chapter 18. So verses 1 through 8, if you want to follow along as far as note-taking, this is what we're going to call the fall of Babylon predicted. Look at verse 1. After these things, after what things? After he just saw this city described and how it was a prostitute, it was a harlot, it was trying to draw men and women away from the God they should love. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. That angel obviously reflecting God in his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. That's just the the language of the scripture from Old Testament language to describe something that has been given over to waste. It's gone. Its powers of darkness have, have brought its ruination to that city. Verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of her earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. What I want you to notice about that city and the reason that the doom is being predicted here is that these people have treated and lived like life is cheap. They've used people, they've abused people, and they've, they've actually given themselves over to every kind of pleasure. Verses 4 and 5. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. We'll come back to that right before we come to the communion table this morning. But go to verse 5. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven. I want you to notice that little phrase there. That is worth pausing for a moment. The word have piled up there is a word in the Greek language of the New Testament that means to glue together or to join. And what it does is it takes us back to this city of Babylon and this tower of Babel that erected its tower and said, we will build our edifice, we will glorify our names, we will be somebody. And so what he's saying here, God is reminding us through John in this vision, is that when God looks at her and God is predicting and telling us judgment is coming on this system, he is saying that he is going to judge the world, those outside of Christ, those who do not know God, he is going to judge them. And what they have done is they have glued together, they have joined together like the Tower of Babel, their own iniquities, and they're just piling up, piling up. Did you notice it says in that same verse, verse 5, And God has remembered her iniquities. He has not forgotten. They have lived it up. They have assumed that this is their world. This is their life. They actually could do what they wanted to with their bodies, with their relationships. They could do anything they wanted to do. It didn't really matter what God wanted. And the Bible says that what God has been doing has been keeping a record of that. He's remembered her iniquities. Verse 6 through 8. So it says, pay her back. Pay her back. Even as she has paid and give back to her double according to her deeds and the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. It sounds like God's serious about this, right? That this is going to be a bad day for the world when Christ returns. He says, verse 7, To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen. I am not a widow and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. That's strong language, isn't it? What he is saying here is that the punishment for the people in this world, people who have rejected Christ, refused Christ, never come to the purpose of living to the glory of God with the aim of enjoying Him forever, that judgment on them will be equitable. 
God has kept a record. He has remembered what they have done. And he is going to judge them to the degree of their sins. Which, by the way, listen, we, we could say hell is hell. But hell is hell in a greater sense for some people than it is for others. And this is what I mean by that. Remember, Jesus told those in his day, he said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had repented, it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you. He is saying that when, when, whenever people who are exposed to op- opportunity and light, that increases the judgment upon them for their sin. There's a degree in which wrath and judgment is measured out in an equitable way. So when people have heard and they've been exposed and, and they, they keep putting it off and rejecting and resisting and saying, no, uh, what is the chief end of man is to live for me. It's my life. It's my world. I'll do what I want with my life. And that person is being exposed to the truth of what God created them for and what the gospel is all about. That is not going to be a good day when this day of judgment happens. Listen, brothers and sisters, we live with the privilege of being in the South where, I mean, there are churches And to some degree, gospel presentations presented constantly around us. You cut on the radio, you've got a church in every corner, and you've got a Bible everywhere you can think of. And in that day, for those who have not responded to that gospel, who have not come to Christ and come God's way, that day is not going to be a good day. Oh, hell will be the same thing for that lost person in Africa who doesn't know Christ who in his own sin has rejected the Creator and turned after his own way of trying to live his life. Oh, hell will be hell, but hell will be doubly hot for that person who has lived, I think, in an area like this, maybe even come to a church like this, heard the Bible, heard the gospel like never before to keep putting it off and resisting it. So in verses 1 through 8, what we have is God predicting the judgment. It will come. And it will be quick. It, notice it says, in one day her plagues will come, which is just a way of saying, listen, you might have built your city, your life, your pleasures for years upon years upon years, but when I come, it is going to be a swift judgment upon you. So that's the fall of Babylon predicted in verses 1 through 8. Next we have what I like to call, and I have outlined in my Bible, the fall of Babylon lamented. In verses 9 through 20. I want you to notice. They're not lamenting like they're sorry to God. They are lamenting because of their world falling apart. It's what the Bible calls worldly sorrow. You know the difference? Worldly sorrow is when you get caught. When you're in trouble. When you've done something wrong. And you feel shamed of what people think of you. You you, you really feel like you've done something so bad and horrible. That you just can't deal with it. But it's all related to how people think of you in this world. And how you view yourself in this world. And that is called worldly sorrow. Listen that's not the kind of sorrow that God is looking for. He's looking for the other kind. It's called godly sorrow. It's sorrow that looks up. It's like when David sinned against Bathsheba and he committed adultery with her and he went out and he had Uriah through his, his conniving and trickery killed and then, he, then he, he messed up his kingdom as a result of that and kept quiet about it. But he finally in the psalm tells us that he came to the point to where he realized and he repented and he humbled himself and he said against you and you only have I sinned and done this great evil and your sight and people misunderstand sometimes that text and say but he sinned against Bathsheba yes he did and he sinned against Uriah and their family and everybody there yes he did but in the end David is going right to the core and the ultimate grief and sorrow that he has to have and that is godly sorrow if he has sorrow towards God he's going to have sorrow right sorrow towards people and so here in verses 9 through 20 when Babylon starts falling down and coming to pieces under the judgment of God. That system is crumbling. The world is is caving in. Um, They're lamenting, but it's not because they're sorry to God. It's just because their stuff is gone. Their world is gone. In fact, if you notice again in verse 10, verse 17, and verse 19, that phrase, in one hour it was gone. And it literally means that in a very swift, quick way. What you thought would never come to an end, what you thought would never be over, actually comes to an end rather quickly. So let's look at who, who loses what there. Every, every, every class of people in verses 9 through 20 and every occupation falls apart, comes to an end. Look at this. In verses 9 through 10. And the kings of the earth 
who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her. And they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Let's start with the people who are going to experience this, those outside of Christ. These are what are called the monarchs, the kings, the rulers. He says they are now gone. Judgment has come. And they are crying. They are weeping. They are not sorry to God. But they are sorry that they have lost their power. That's what they're sorry for. Verses 11 through 17 describes another group of people in an occupation that is gone. And it's called the merchants. The merchants are gone. Look at verse 11 to 17. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys her their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from every costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes uh, of horses and chariots and slaves and humans. The fruit you long for has gone from you. In other words, your career is over. And isn't that part of what this system is about in this world? It's living for the career. It's not we make money and we do what we do to serve our God, to love Him, to honor Him and that. That's what we think of as God's people. But the world is thinking of this is my thing. This is my stuff. This is a way to make a name for me. This is a way to actually live for what matters most to me in this world. And so these are losses of careers. Verse 15. The merchants of these things who become rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. So the merchants and all of their enterprising and all of their income is gone. Verse 17, he continues, and every shipmaster. So not only are we seeing here that the monarchs, the king's power is gone, the merchants are gone, the loss of career has taken place, but now the mariners, those who are the shipmasters, those who are related to the industries of that water, they've lost their wealth as well. Look at what it says. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out weeping and mourning saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which we all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth for in one hour she has been laid waste. Can you get the picture guys? That the people who do not know Christ, who do not care about the glory of God, whose life is bent on their life and their world, they are standing here and they are seeing their world crumble and fall apart and they are literally crying their eyes out because their stuff is gone. Their world is caving in. And so they're lamenting, they are crying. Now verse 20 is just an insert here to remind us of something very important. Verse 20, it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. You know, that's God's way of just saying, I hadn't forgot about you. Okay, right now we're talking about what's going to happen to them, but I want you to know, I have not forgotten about you. No, it's not rejoicing again over judgment upon people who are lost, who have not come to Christ, but it is rejoicing that God's righteousness and justice is prevailing and that he has not forgotten us, his people. That's what he is saying. So, Babylon's fall is predicted in the first eight verses. Babylon is lamented over in verses 9 through 20. And then finally, the fall of Babylon is completed. Look at verses 21 through 24. And I want you to notice this little phrase that over and over is used in these verses. And that is, it will not be found any longer. It will not be found any longer. I mean, through the history of man, from the physical, literal city of Babylon, when they would rise, then they would fall, then they would rise, and then they would fall. Cities would come, powers would come. But there is coming a day when all the cities of man, all the world of man is going to be over and no longer. So look at verses 21 through 23. Then a strong angel took up a stone 
like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence, and here it is, will not be found any longer. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And, they, and the sound of meal will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth because of all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Now let's pause right there. Just think of what he is saying here. Everything in their life and their world, no longer. He says in verse 22, music ceases. Isn't that interesting? This is the day that the music died, for sure. (laughs) This is the day. (laughs) And what he's saying is, listen, everything you sang about, everything you loved, everything you, you you know, you you, uh, thought a song should be about, You'll have nothing to sing about anymore. Nothing. Don't matter, it doesn't matter which genre of music it is. There'll be nothing in this world system of, of music to sing about any longer. The music ceases, verse 22. The work comes to an end. Your careers are gone forever. If you're in this world, there is no more building up your, repu- your repertoire. There is no more building up your savings account. There is no more working towards retirement. Your work is over, he says. It's done. It'll be no longer. In verse 22, he goes on and he says, domestic life will cease. In other words, nobody's going to be preparing food. There's no grinding of the meal. That's pretty common in their day. What they're saying is the day-to-day function of how we live, it is over. Nothing to sing about, no work to do, careers ended, nothing worth cooking for. It's a bad day. And look at verse 23. Isn't this the saddest thing? Because I'm, I'm right now, again, in the midst of working, uh, as you know, to a great day of celebration with Rachel and, and Caleb and just thinking about the joys of what marriage is for God's people. But what's this? It says in verse 23 that there will be no more bridegroom and bride. No more marriages. No more weddings. Wow. What a day. The point is, every imaginable thing and every imaginable occupation of life, like a candle is being snuffed out by the judgment of God because their world system is over when Jesus returns. Now here's how the chapter ends. Watch this. Verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all who have been slain on the earth. What he is saying here to us is that the response of that world to God's people is going to, again, be uh, destruction. There is no sense in which they go, you know what, you Christians were right all along. Uh, I, I should have paid attention. Now, will some people come to Christ? Absolutely they will. But he's giving us the picture of that world system and predominantly what the world is, is after. We've already seen it in chapter 17. They want to take the blood of the saints. They want to destroy the prophets and all who have lived on the earth. They want to, they don't, it doesn't mesh with their system, God's people. So they are done. Now, next week we're going to come to chapter 19 and we're going to look at chapter 19 which has to do with... Uh, the delight of God's people, that justice has come. God's people have been rescued. You see what it says in verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1? After these things, after what? Just like when he started chapter 18, he said, after these things, he just described Babylon in chapter 17. In chapter 18, he's told us about the destruction of Babylon. And it says in chapter 19, verse 1, after these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And listen, church, from this point on in the book of Revelation, it is shouting time for us, for the rest of the book. Listen, ever since chapter 15, it's been, it's been hard messages, right? It's been difficult things to hear in this section of the book of Revelation about what it will be like when Christ comes back, what it will be like for those who are in the system of this world. When the reaper comes And he comes to reap and judge. From chapter 15 now through chapter 18, it has been hard. It has been hard. Chapter 19 going forward is now for us to think about the city of God. 
and the glory that is coming. And what that literally means, that he started in the beginning of the book by breaking those seals and taking ownership of the earth, what it really means when he comes again and he sets up his eternal kingdom and his purposes will never, ever end. That's what it's going to be. But what is this going to say to us this morning? You can, you can just listen to this as we get ready. I'm going to ask the music team to come. We're going to sing as, together before we get ready to take of the bread and the cup. But I want you to, to think with me just for a moment what this passage is telling you to do. Because every time we open the Bible, every time we read the scriptures, it ought to make us say, what does God want me to do? Right? And I promise you, church, it is not that he wants you just to understand this passage or debate over where you think Babylon is or if it is a literal city or a figurative city being used to teach us an important lesson. It's not what he wants us to do. He wants us to take from the text something very important. There's two things I think it is. And it's back in verse 4. When he says in verse 4, come out, my people, what could that be? Well, I think that could be an evangelistic call to God's elect. In other words, we know that that term elect are those God has set his heart upon and he is determined to bring to Christ. So when you hear a message like this, it is a reminder, if you're not a Christian, it's time to come out. It's time to leave that system and that world which I so loved and I long for and my world is built around. It's time to come to the God who has the plan that he has designed for us. And that is the plan of the gospel through his son. In fact, in Colossians 1, you know this verse, don't you? Verses 13 and 14, it says, when someone comes to Christ, this is what happens. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. The city of Babylon is a kingdom of darkness. He has taken us out of that and he's put us in the kingdom of his beloved son. So what this passage is doing in Revelation 18 is if you are here and you are not a Christian, it is pleading with you to come out and to come to Christ. That's what it's pleading with you to do. I didn't say it's asking you to start going to church because people can go to church and be just as in that world as ever. People can read the Bible, they can pray, they can do all kind of things. He is not saying, start doing some religious stuff. He's saying, make a break, repent, come to Christ, come to Christ. And as we come to the table in just a moment, uh, if you haven't come to Christ, if you're not a believer, uh, you need to let this pass by you. It's, it's a table that God does not take lightly for unbelievers to take up. So don't take of that. If your children are not believers, you want to hold them back and just say, this is not the time This is not for you right now. So this is a call. It's an evangelistic call. But maybe more more for us here today, it's a call. It can be a call of of evaluation as to God's people. It's calling us to come out. If you took your time and you read in the scriptures, everywhere you see Israel falling into sin in the Old Testament, it's a call, come out of Babylon. Leave her. Forsake her. Don't follow her. It's a call for us today in this Revelation 18 to evaluate, as Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, the mercies of God. I beseech you, Paul says, I beg of you, because of the mercies of God that you present your your bodies a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed, it says, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God is calling us as believers, and I could spend a lot of time, couldn't we, on this, thinking about all the scriptures that keep calling us to realize there's a real potential danger for us as believers to imbibe the very world in which we live and the way they think, the way they, what they want, and our lives look like them. There's danger upon danger, warning upon warning in scripture. Paul had to write a whole book to the Corinthians about that subject. James, in, in closing, says this in chapter 4. You adulteresses, you do not know, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And finally, John, this is every epistle, every book, keeps calling us to evaluate what the world is in our life or if it has come in. So 1 John 2.15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him.